again. Glad to see you here for another episode of Killer Bites. So happy you could join, but sorry in advance for the terrifying story I'm about to tell you. To say it feels unjust whenever I tell you about cases involving young children and the abuse they face at the hands of their families is an understatement. Why would someone bring life into this world only to cause it harm? It's a question that I unfortunately do not have the answer to. Today, we're going to look into the world of satanic cults and a young girl named Teresa who escaped from one in the 1980s. While many may associate Satanism with violent and extreme behavior, the reality is that modern Satanism can take on a variety of forms, including philosophical, religious, or even humorous. Church of Satan, anyone? These days, you can find Satanists baking cookies, telling jokes, or even fighting for reproductive rights much of it with more than a hint of irony. However, the 80s and 90s were wild, and Satanism was viewed as something far more insidious than a Twitter account heckling zealots. Historical research suggests that nearly all societies in history have developed the idea of an anti-human force that can hide itself within society. The idea developed is that certain individuals in society make a pact with the devil. Anthropologists believe that the idea of this pact possibly emerged after the observation of pacts with gods and goddesses that played a role in various pre-Christian belief systems. The word Satan was not originally a proper name, but rather an ordinary noun that means adversary. Most commonly throughout history, this involves the belief in witches, a group of individuals that the community believe are out to seek harm. For instance, by engaging in incest, murder, and cannibalism. The satanic panic was a phrase used causing a moral panic which spread throughout the United States and parts of Europe, primarily in the 1980s and early 1990s. There was a widespread belief that a secret network of Satanists were responsible for a variety of crimes, including child abduction, murder, and ritual abuse. Belief in satanic ritual abuse spread rapidly. The satanic panic was fueled by a combination of factors, including sensationalized media coverage, conspiracy theories, and a general sense of social anxiety and uncertainty. Many of these claims were later found to be based on unreliable or sensationalized testimony, and there is little to no evidence to support the idea that there is a widespread network of organized satanic cults engaging in ritual abuse or other illegal activities. That being said, there have been cases of individuals who claim to have escaped from or been rescued from supposed satanic cults, but there's been little evidence to confirm this. Proof was provided in the bits of information such as pictures drawn by patients, heavy metal album covers, historical folklore about devil worshippers, and pictures of animals. In 1989, 60 Minutes Australia aired an interview with reporter Ian Leslie talking to a young British girl who went by the name Teresa. At the time of the interview, Teresa was 15. Ian Leslie started the story off by saying that for the first 12 years of Teresa's life, she was the victim of relentless depravity. The interview with Teresa is intense and it is incredibly shocking from start to finish. So much of the interview is hard to believe. Teresa is soft-spoken, however, she speaks with conviction. It doesn't feel as if she's necessarily lying, but the stories she tells are so far-fetched. Teresa's mother is also interviewed, and between the two of them relaying similar stories and painting pictures of some truly inhumane instances, there were moments I thought, why would they make this up? And then there are some moments where I have to question how it could be real. How did her mother not know what was happening? Were they not in contact for most of Teresa's life? Ian, Leslie, and 60 Minutes sat down with both Teresa and her mother, Bridget. Bridget explained to Ian that when her first marriage ended, she took the children with her. But raising them all alone was too hard while she was still recovering from the demise of her relationship, and she couldn't cope with taking care of them. She then left her two children with her father, who she never names in the interview. Bridget said that as soon as her ex-husband was taking care of their children, he moved back in with his mother. Bridget never explained why her husband left his mother's house, but when he did, he left his children with his mom. 
Teresa was only two when she started to live with her grandma, Nan. The abuse at the hands of her grandmother unfortunately began very early on. Nan was a part of a satanic cult, and she would take her grandchildren with her to ritualistic ceremonies. During the ceremonies, the group of people Teresa were with talked often about the devil, only referring to him as Lucifer. The rituals would take place in a large house in the countryside of Britain. From the outside, it looked like a castle. Before Nan would take her, she would be drugged or knocked out so that she wouldn't know where she was. Teresa would only come to when she arrived at the home. It was extremely important to Nan that Teresa and the people that were being brought to the house were totally unaware of the route to get to the location. She never knew what to expect once she was at the secret house. Each ritual and ceremony would be different. Teresa and the other children there were often put in coffin-like boxes that were filled with spiders and snakes with the lid shut. They'd then be left there for long periods of time. She believed the people who owned the house and the other cult members were very wealthy people. Maybe that extreme wealth could explain how so many crimes were able to go undetected. Between the age of 2 and 11, any time Teresa was brought to a ritual, she would experience abuse, sometimes physical, sometimes emotional. She spoke of watching a vagrant man brought into one of these sacrificial rituals. Someone who was possibly drunk, maybe on drugs, but not someone she had seen before. He was standing in front of her and the rest of the cult members, laughing. But not long after he was brought in did the odd laughing turn into screaming. The members of the cult cut him from his throat to his stomach, killed right in front of her, and the screams of the man being cut from top to bottom were seared in her brain. This was not the first person she had seen these people kill. The sacrifices happened often. Newborn babies, small children, really anyone they wanted. It wasn't something she ever got used to. When rituals of sacrifice would happen in front of her, the only thing going through her mind at the time was, thank God it's not me. Teresa spoke to Ian Leslie about being taken to the house and being forced to be intimate with the adults there, anywhere between 10 to 20 people at a time. Her grandmother would either partake in the group sex or laugh at the expense of her grandchildren being taken advantage of. She said that her grandma, Nan, would make her participate in bestiality. After the kids were made to do things with the adults and with the animals, a sacrifice of an animal or human would take place. At the age of 11, Teresa gave birth to a baby girl she named Alex. Her pregnancy with Alex was not the only time she fell pregnant while under the supervision of her grandmother. Teresa told her mom that she was pregnant seven other times, all pregnancies resulting in miscarriage or abortion, usually performed by Nan. Sometimes it would be performed by a doctor at the secret countryside house. Teresa said that there were two doctors and a nurse that were a part of the cult. For most of her pregnancies, the doctor or Nan, whoever was performing the procedure, took the fetuses out of her womb still alive. There were a couple times that Teresa tried to run away. Each time she tried, she was caught by her uncle who would bring her back to Nan's. Teresa said it never occurred to her to go to the police and report what was happening. Knowing you don't like something is one thing, but if it's all you've ever known, why wouldn't you assume it was something that happened to everyone? She compared her thinking to not liking going to school or the dentist, but having to go anyway. She thought it was normal. So because she thought this was a normal life, she went to school assuming it was everyone's normal life. Teresa described an incident to Ian Leslie where she was at school one day and she was sitting in class. She asked her teacher if she could go to the restroom and when she got there, she discovered she had had a miscarriage. The baby was in the knickers, she said. It was still moving, but it did not live long. She went to the nurse at school and was treated for a fever, but nothing else. Either the nurse knew and didn't do anything, or Teresa didn't tell the school what had happened for fear that she would be forced to have a ritual with Nan. Teresa took a pencil case of hers and ended up making a coffin for the fetus. She put roses in it to make it smell sweet. She included a letter to the baby in her makeshift coffin, as well as a picture of her, her brother, and her mother. Once she had added all of the keepsakes, she threw the pencil case in the garbage chute. 
She didn't want Nan to get to the baby, so she threw it away. The cannibalism occurred regularly with babies, but what was happening to the bodies of the adults that were brought in for the rituals and cut from top to bottom? Teresa said that there was a large tub at the countryside house. The bodies and the bones would be put in the tub, and then a chemical would be added to the tub, and the bodily remains would then turn into a sludge. The sludge could then be cleaned and cleared out, and the remains would just be gone. Ian Leslie interviewed one other person, a top therapist named Ray Wire. Very few, if any, had counseled as many victims of satanic abuse as Ray Wire. At the time of the interview, he was considered somewhat of an expert on satanic cults. When Ray was asked if he believed Teresa's story, he said he did. Ray said that at the time of reading the transcript of Teresa's 60-minute interview, he had already dealt with 21 cases like hers in less than a two-year span. There were similar themes throughout the victim stories. Being put in boxes with spiders and trapped in fear for long periods of time, human sacrifice. He said that the believability he had was the children of different ages all reporting the same information. Ray believed that there was no way a child of four, five, six, 15 could all know about rituals and sacrifices without it having been real for them. Ray had experience as a therapist with convicted criminals, and he had no doubt in his mind that there are people capable of these specific types of crimes. He didn't understand how there could be any doubts in the accounts when they're describing people within Satanism. The fact that those people actually believe in evil with the right to express evil of course, something like this could happen. The following year, after the 60 Minutes episode with Teresa and her mother Bridget had aired, they spoke with Ian Leslie for a documentary called The Devil Made Me Do It. The documentary focused on well-known cases of satanic killings in the United States and England. A group of victims, as well as heavy metal singers, clergymen, and satanic leaders came together for a debate. When Ian spoke with Teresa, he asked her all of the same questions he had asked her the year prior. The questions were the same, and so the stories Teresa recounted in this documentary were the same as or similar to the ones told in her 60 Minutes interview. Teresa said that when she was first a part of the rituals, it was only animals that were being sacrificed. There was a big table in the house they were at, and on that table was a big star. During the sacrifice, the animal would be placed on the table and cut in half. Then the animal sacrifices turned to human ones. Similarly, the humans would be placed on the table and cut in half. But the rituals became increasingly more violent. The differences in this interview compared to the 60 Minutes were that instead of her uncle finding her when she tried to run away, the cult had sent dogs out to find her, and she thought that being caught by the dogs was how she was gonna die. When the vagrant was sacrificed, she was made to eat him. All the people there had to eat him for Lucifer. When Ian spoke with Bridget in the documentary, he asked her about Teresa's upbringing, and she said, I thought she was just hurt by the breakup of myself and her father. Um, what? Unfortunately, from both of the conversations, it's never clear what Bridget's involvement with any of her children is when they're being taken care of by Nan. It's also never mentioned how Teresa found her way back home to her mother. When Bridget and Teresa joined the other members participating in the documentary, The Devil Made Me Do It, they were joined by a panel of people who were contributing on the topic. Two people that actually were on the panel were Robert Ludwig and Dr. Aquino. Both had similar sentiments that there are people in the world, and certainly people in every religion, that go out into the world with the intention to do terrible things. While there are Satanists that call themselves such and are practicing horrific crimes, there are also people who are Christians or Buddhists who are claiming their religion and also committing equally horrific crimes. When things happen in these other religions, they aren't being held accountable in the same way Satanists are. Dr. Aquino said, People can commit crimes in the name of Christ or in the name of the devil, and in any case, the crime is actually committed by a person, and not by something that is being used as a scapegoat or as a theological excuse for that crime. Robert Ludwig, a Satanist, said, Satanists are simply rebelling against Christianity. 
Christians are what's giving his religion a bad name. When Robert was asked about Teresa's story, he said something very disturbing and disgusting took place, but it certainly got nothing to do with Satanism. What people have done is use rituals or games to justify their own lunacy, their own perversions. That's got nothing to do with genuine magic, genuine occultism, or genuine Satanism. He continued saying, sick, perverted people do things to people, and that's what happened. After this documentary, Teresa never gave another interview regarding what had happened to her. There's little to no information regarding her whereabouts now and what happened to the people that harmed her. There is not a trace. There's no information about where Bridget is, and there's no information regarding what happened to her daughter Alex that she left behind when she ran away. What we do know is that the satanic panic, which started in the mid-1980s, was over by 1995. The initial investigations of satanic ritual abuse were performed by anthropologists and sociologists who failed to find evidence of the abuse actually occurring. It was concluded that the ritual abuse was a result of rumors and folklore that were spread by media hype Christian fundamentalism, mental health, and law enforcement professionals. Sociologists and journalists noted the nature with which evangelical activists and other religious groups were using claims of satanic ritual abuse to further their religious and political goals. It was suggested that the entire phenomenon of blaming Satanism was an attempt by a group of radical feminists to undermine the concept of a nuclear family, which is a family that consists of a two-parent household still intact. The sociologists and journalists also believed the satanic ritual abuse allegations really began as a backlash against working women, people who were gay, and childcare workers. And lastly, but most certainly not least, the panic was due to the universal need to believe in evil. The concept of Satanism and satanic cults has a long and complex history, rooted in religious fear and the worship of dark deities. Information about satanic ritual abuse claims spread through conferences presented to religious groups, churches, and professionals, such as police forces and therapists, as well as parents. These kinds of conferences helped foster communication between different groups, maintaining and spreading disproven or exaggerated stories as fact. Members of local police forces organized into loose networks focused on cult crimes, some of whom billed themselves as experts and were paid to speak at conferences throughout the United States. Religious revivalists also took advantage of the rumors and preached about the dangers of Satanism to youth and presented themselves at paid engagements as secular experts. At the very height of the Satanic Panic, the highly emotional accusations and circumstances of satanic ritual abuse allegations made it extremely difficult to investigate all of the claims, with the accused being assumed as guilty. Trials moved forward based solely on the testimony of very young children without corroborating evidence. No such evidence has ever been found for religiously based cannibalistic or murderous satanic ritual abuse, despite extensive investigations. One explanation for the allegations is that they were based upon false memories. False memories can be created or influenced by a variety of factors, including suggestions from others, leading questions, misinformation, imagination, and emotional or psychological factors. Research has shown that false memories can be surprisingly easy to create and that they can feel just as real and vivid as true memories. False memories can have serious implications, particularly in legal contexts where eyewitness testimony or other forms of evidence may be used to convict individuals of crimes. It was proven that law enforcement and therapists were using suggestive techniques such as leading questions when speaking with these victims and that was what was causing the false memories. A British study published in 1996 found 62 cases of alleged ritual abuse reported to researchers by police. Social and welfare agencies from the period of 1988 to 1991, 
This study represented a tiny proportion of extremely high profile cases compared to the total number of cases investigated by the agencies. An anthropologist by the name of Jean LaFontaine spent several years researching ritual abuse cases in Britain. LaFontaine found that all of the cases of alleged satanic ritual abuse that could be substantiated were cases where the abuser's goal was sexual gratification rather than the religious worship. The only rituals she uncovered were those invented by child abusers to frighten their victims or justify the sexual abuse. She also discovered that the sexual abuse occurred outside of the rituals, indicating once more that the goal of the abuser wasn't based on religion. It was also found that in cases involving satanic abuse, the satanic allegations by younger children were influenced by adults. As I mentioned, the idea of Satanism or the religion of Satan is much different today than the panic that once ensued. There are still individuals and groups who identify as Satanists and engage in practices and beliefs that are considered controversial or taboo by mainstream society. However, if you look at Satanists today, they are typically someone who's just not conforming to the religious restraints conservative religions tend to have. Satanism is a non-theistic religion that emphasizes individualism, self-expression, and personal empowerment. Anton LaVey, who was referred to as the father of Satanism and the founder of the Church of Satan believed that the ideal Satanist should be individualistic and nonconformist, rejecting what he called the colorless existence that mainstream society sought to impose on those living within it. He stated that self-indulgence was a desirable trait and that hate and aggression were not wrong or undesirable emotions, but that they were necessary for survival. He believed that the seven deadly sins, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride were virtues which were beneficial for the individual. A number of religious studies scholars have described Anton LaVey's Satanism as a form of self-religion or self-spirituality. Satanists don't believe that Satan literally exists and they do not worship him. The devil is a symbol of defiance against the suppression of humanity's natural instincts. Anton LaVey stated that God is a creation of man, rather than man being a creation of God. In his book, The Satanic Bible, the Satanist's concept of a god is described as the Satanist's true self, a projection of his or her own personality, not an external deity. Satan is not an external deity, but is used as a representation of individualism. One story that brings light to a positive side of Satanism in its championing of tolerance and freedom of expression is in 2012, when a Christian baker in Colorado declined to make a wedding cake for a gay couple, members of the Satanic Temple called in asking for cakes praising the devil. While sexual orientation is not explicitly protected by the Civil Rights Act, it's against the law for businesses to refuse customers based on their individual religion. The bakery had no choice but to process the orders. There's something strangely admirable about the Satanic Temple using its status as an official religion to protect citizens and civil liberties from the encroachment of other religions. The Satanic Temple was co-founded by two men, Lucian Greaves and Malcolm Jari, who met in 2012. The temple was active by January of 2013. In an interview with the New York Times, Malcolm Jory stated that the idea of starting a satanic faith-based organization was first conceived to meet all the Bush administration's criteria for receiving funds, but was repugnant to them. The idea was motivated by the former president, George W. Bush's formation of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. According to the organization's website, the mission of the Satanic Temple is to encourage benevolence and empathy among all people, reject tyrannical authority, advocate practical common sense, oppose injustice, and undertake noble pursuits. The Satanic Temple has publicly confronted hate groups, fought for the abolition of corporal punishment in public school, applied for equal representation when religious installations are placed on public property, provided religious exemption and legal protection against laws that unscientifically restrict women's reproductive autonomy, 
exposed harmful pseudoscientific practitioners in mental health care, organized clubs alongside other religious after-school clubs in schools besieged by proselytizing organizations, and engaged in other advocacy in accordance with our tenets. So what it sounds like to me is that the religious groups of Satanists have really found a way to use religion for progress. They really found a way to make it work for them. Will I be calling myself a Satanist anytime soon? Probably not, but I'm here for what they're standing up for. It's interesting that from something that had such dark folklore, there were people that were able to take the exact definition and turn it into a religion that, to me, is anything but the dark folklore it once was. The reality is that there are people in the world who have claimed every type of religion, who are out in the world doing wrong. It's not the name of the religion that determines what is evil, it's the person. And that is the story of satanic cults, the satanic temple, and Teresa, the young girl who escaped. A lot of her stories are hard to wrap my brain around, and I'm sure you would agree. What I know now from all of these Killer Bites episodes is that there are some truly terrible, terrible people out there in the world committing truly terrible crimes. I know that there are many families that have committed similar crimes and endangering their young ones, but there's just not a name like satanic cult attached to it. I know that I believe victims, no matter how hard or crazy a story is to hear. We should believe victims. All of that to say, the panic that occurred in the 80s and 90s really was spurred by adults and their fear of something, and that they then attached that fear to a name, satanic cult. It's proven that most of the crimes that were reported were either not real or they were not due to a satanic cult. I don't understand how Teresa and her mother have just completely disappeared. Were any of the people that were accused in the crimes against Teresa ever convicted? And where are they now? If what happened to Teresa is in fact true, was Bridget still in contact with her daughter while her daughter was living with Nan? Is that considered child endangerment? Was Bridget ever charged with that? There are a lot of unanswered questions, but sometimes not everything has an answer and that doesn't make it any less true. I would love to hear any and all of your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think about the history of Satanism? What do you think about the Church of Satan? What do you think about the satanic panic? Do you believe the story that Teresa told about her dark satanic cult escape? Thank you all for watching another dark episode of Killer Bites. My name is Brandy, y'all stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time.